Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesboroabaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesboroabaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Good morning. Welcome to Wilkesboro Baptist Church. I'm the backup to the backup here this morning. <laughs> Uh, we had a couple of fires to put out, so you got me. Uh, we're grateful that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Uh, a few reminders as we head into the week of Thanksgiving. This is a week of thankfulness and gratefulness, and we're going to display that as a church congregation. Um, if you're planning on uh, making a pumpkin pie for his life for the meal on Thursday, please have those pumpkin pies back here to the church by noon on Wednesday. Um, next Sunday night, we've got our next member meeting. That's going to happen at 5.30, followed by dessert in the fellowship hall, so we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, and then tomorrow afternoon, 4 p.m., we're going to be decorating the church. Uh, so if you're willing to help, uh, we'd love to have your assistance this week. And then also, just a good reminder, for Wednesday night, we will not have any Wednesday night activities here at church due to Thanksgiving. Um, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 7:17. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. And we're going to do just that this morning. Dr. Mike. together now as we sing, come ye thankful people, come. Let's bring our praise and adoration and thankfulness to the God who loves us.
Joanna says we sing page 639. Now thank we all our God. everybody. We'll get a chance to participate in baptism, celebrate God's uh, work in the heart and life of a young man. Uh, Killian, if you will come on now. This is Killian Freeman. Killian is five and a half. He wanted to make sure I got that half in uh, just a few minutes ago. Killian and his family, uh, Chance and Nicole, they've been coming to church for a couple years now. We had a chance to baptize Chance and Nicole a couple years ago. And they've been talking with Killian about faith and following Jesus for a while at home. And uh, he trusted Jesus to be a Savior about ten days ago or so. And uh, we've got a baptism we're going to have to have next week. So I talked with the Freemans about maybe delaying baptism until next Sunday. And uh, Killian said, uh, I've already waited a week. It is time for me to be baptized and follow Jesus. <laughs> this little fella knows Jesus as Lord and Savior, and we're excited to celebrate with him baptism. So, Killian, who is Jesus? Our Lord, our God, and our Savior. And Killian, will you follow Jesus with our help? Yeah. Congregation, yeah. with prayer and encouragement, yeah. will you help Killian to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior? Yeah. 
Kaylee and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a blessing to see baptism and experience blast. I see a lot, I see some tears, joyous tears coming through. It's a great time. It's always a good opportunity when we see new life uh, come into the life of our church. Uh, we have a lot going on. I hope you've been in prayer. It's holiday season. Pray for those that are, uh, you know, maybe have to, to miss a loved one this holiday season and just be thinking about them. Uh, Samaritan's Purse is our prayer partner for this week, and they do a phenomenal time, uh, you know, working and ministering. They've got the shoe boxes coming on, so if you haven't grabbed a shoe box and you still want to participate in that ministry, you can pick up a few. We have a few left. We'd love for you to get that in this week, if you could. We'd be praying for the Samaritan's Purse people as they give out these shoe boxes, as they prepare them, and they send them out to kids all over the world. Be praying for those. And then to pray for our unreached people group, the Japanese people. We pray that the gospel will be revealed to them. Messengers will be sent so that they can hear the love of God through Jesus, his son. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, we are so thankful for an opportunity to come worship in your house, lift up your name, reflect on the many blessings that you continue to pour out on us. Lord, we are thankful to lift up our voices to you in gratitude. Lord, be with those that have come to know you. Give them strength and passion. Be with those that, as they enter into this, this holiday season, that they um, just look to you as the Prince of Peace, as they look to you as the living hope. Be with the Samaritan's Purse, people that are working through all of the different situations with uh, all the different ministries they're doing with the shoeboxes and as they gather and send them out to children around the world. Be with the Japanese people as they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the good, good news. Be with us now as we continue to worship. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue a time of song together and thankfulness. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen. Sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just
so glad I learned to trust Thee. sweet reminder. Thanks for your singing this morning. We're going to continue in a time of celebration of God's holy, sovereign hand over our past, our present, and our future. This is God, hold to God's unchanging hand. Brooke's going to lead us off here. One, two, one, two. Time is filled with swift transition. No. Thanks for singing with us. Amen. You can be seated. Folks, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn with me to Luke chapter 2. That's where we're going to take our text from this morning. If you're a guest with us, we're glad that you're here. We, uh, Some of you, I know, are here for baptism. We're glad that you're here to celebrate baptism, Killian's baptism. But in any case, if you're a guest, we'd love for you to take the tear tab in your worship guide. Put your name and contact information on it. I'd love to follow up with you later this week, see how your visit was today. And, and just as a reminder, the member meeting is tonight at church, not, not next Sunday at church. We're in a new series entitled Seasons Blessings. Uh, as a pastor, so I work through Advent season, 
uh, we always are looking for uh, ways to draw attention in our scripture, uh, what's going on in, in the time of year in the life of the church. And I, I'll just say this, and you know this from your Bible, there are not many places to go to in scripture to talk about Advent. And so Luke chapter 2 is one of those that we come back to pretty regularly. A number of years ago, I preached a sermon from this text, but we're going to look at it from a little different angle and a little different perspective this morning as we read the latter part of Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. And we're thinking about blessings. Blessings are those things that we experience, and aren't we blessed? I mean, just be honest. We have houses to sleep in. We have clothes to wear. We have food to eat. We have our needs met, and most of us, if we're being honest, we have an overabundance of needs being met. We have so many things that, that, that we are taken care of, we're blessed, we're, we're provided for, and, and so blessings are those things that we reflect on and think about. As we think about blessings in the Gospel of Luke, there are numerous times where the, the characters that are interacting with Jesus' advent speak blessings. That's the nature of the series. So over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to see their specific statements about a blessing here or there based on what God has done in their lives and how God has interacted in their lives. Here's a question for all of us. Are the blessings that we experience for us? Or at least are they? is that the primary goal of the blessings for us? I, th- I think that's a yes and no answer. Absolutely. When God gives you blessings, they're intended for you and I to experience and to think about. But there's a deeper thing going on with God's blessings. He doesn't just give them to us for us. He gives them to us for His glory. He gives them to us to, in order for the blessings we experience to spread through us and go to other people. And that's what we see in this blessing this morning. It's a blessing of thanksgiving. I'm going to see it from an interesting character in Luke chapter 2. Her name is Anna. Read with me, if you will, Luke 2, verse 36. There was a prophetess, Anna, daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting uh, with prayer day and night, And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Beautiful text of scripture. Who was Anna? Anna was a lady who was getting up there in years. She was at the very least in her 80s. That phrase is not altogether clear whether it means she was married for seven years and then was a widow for 84 years after her husband's death or whether she was a widow until she was 84, having only been married seven years. In any case, she was getting up there in years, and she had been a widow for a very, very long time. She was a person who, in her circumstances and situations, did not have a whole lot to be grateful for, not for the things she faced. She was grateful in spite of that. So what we're going to look at this morning as we look at the, this season of blessing, this Thanksgiving blessing, What we're going to see is one principle and four practices. The principle is this. We can give thanks regardless of circumstance or age in life. There's no thing that you and I face, no circumstance that we go through, no amount of age that, that causes us not to be able to give thanks. And Anna is testimony of that. The text says she was a prophetess. That at the very least, that means she was someone who lived a life worthy of emulation. She had a character that was respectable. It's very possible that she spoke to people, very likely that she spoke to people in and out of the temple as they came in, that she spoke about God's blessings and God's goodness. Without question, in the latter part of the text, she spoke about Jesus to all those who were there. So she was not someone who, who kept her, she was not just an internal Christian. She was someone who used her mouth and used her voice to proclaim the goodness of God. She, being, being someone who was struggling with widowhood, that was a pretty significant challenge in her life. And as I look out across our congregation this morning, and as I thought about folks in our early service and our 930 service, so many people who are part of Wilkesboro Baptist Church 
would, would be a widow. There are a lot of those who are widows, a lot of those who are widowers, a lot of, of you in our congregation who have suffered loss and suffered grief. And especially this time of year, my heart goes out to you as your pastor, as a congregation, as deacons and as leaders, we, we pray for you and we pray that God will offer you a measure of comfort and a measure of peace. And this text gives us an example of someone who knows your pain. She went through what you went through. She suffered the loss of a husband. And in, the, in ancient Israel, a widow was, uh, was, was, the possibility of her being insecure was strong. Uh, in, in other words, in the ancient world, today's world, as, as men and women, we're not limited so much by our gender in terms of experiences in life. In the ancient world, a woman couldn't necessarily run her own a business. She couldn't necessarily own property. Her security in many cases in the ancient world, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying this is the way it was 2,000 years ago. Her security rested in either the home she grew up in, her father, or the, the person she, had married, she was married to, her husband. And, and so in a very real sense, Anna relied on others to take care of her. Her security and provision during the time of her being a widow, it could have come from her dad, from her family, uh, given that she lost a husband. It could have come from her husband's family. It could have come from a son that we don't read about in the text that may be provided for her. In any case, Anna was someone who relied upon others for her to be taken care of. Her provision rested in, in dependence. She depended on others. She, she went through a time of difficulty with regard to her security. And she was getting up there in years. Some of you have, as church members have encouraged me over the course of my time here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church with what, is, what I can expect to happen as I get older. You, you have let me know some of the things that are going to take place. You've let me know some of, the, some of the pains and the aches and the difficulties of aging. Aging is not for the faint of heart. It's not. It, 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 is, it provides all sort of challenges that none of us, as we're younger, expected or really knew what to expect. So Anna was a person who not only suffered the insecurity of being a widow, she was also someone who suffered the natural difficulties of aging, of, of getting older in life. And yet, the text tells us, she still gave thanks. The principle is this. No matter the age we are, no matter the circumstance we have in life, no matter the situation we're facing, we always have reason to give thanks. We shouldn't say to the Lord or to others, I'll be grateful when. That's not an attitude of, of thankfulness. We should say this, gratitude is not primarily about the experiences we've had or the experiences we long for. Gratitude is about our attitude toward the God who is in charge of those experiences. Let me say that again. Gratitude is not primarily about the good experiences we've had or longed for, but it is about our attitude toward the God who is in charge of our experiences. Anna was not a person who, who looked around at her situation and said, I'm not going to be grateful because I experienced X, Y, Z. What she said is, I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to worship God because he is faithful and he is worthy and he is someone that I can give my attention and focus to. You say, Pastor, I realize that I'm supposed to be thankful. And I know you're preaching this sermon because this upcoming Thursday is Thanksgiving. When we as Americans express gratitude for the situations we have experienced in life, the freedoms we have as American citizens. And to that I say, absolutely. That's exactly right. And you might say, but I don't feel very grateful. And that might be right, true, right as well. Some of you... And I don't know all the situations you're going through, but many of you have come into my office and you've sat down and you've told me what's going on. Some of you have shared with me your stories. Some of you, I just know your stories from counseling and from pastoring you. And, and some of us do not have good reasons circumstantially to be thankful. If we're waiting on feeling good enough to be thankful or waiting on our situation in life to bring us to gratitude, we may be waiting a long time. But do you realize that regardless of situation or circumstance in life, we can still be grateful? We can be grateful because of the practices that Anna put in place. She lived in a way that, that encouraged or inspired gratitude in her own life and in, in her own circumstance and situation. She practiced her faith. She practiced it 
well. It, it, practices are those things that we do on a regular basis to get better at something. Dr. Mike played the trumpet for us this morning as part of our regular worship. It doesn't just happen by accident. He can't just pick it up once ever and, and be able to play for us in a way that encourages us. None of the musicians that, that participate in our worship can do that. They have to practice at it. And, and our Christian life is no different. We have to practice our faith. Now, now, God isn't waiting on us to do better in order to get to heaven. God doesn't invite our effort into salvation, meaning you can't earn your way into heaven. You can't be good enough to experience God's forgiveness. That's not the way practice works. We get our salvation. We get forgiveness through grace. But after we've received grace through Jesus Christ, God offers to us the privilege of entering into a regular relationship with Him that includes spiritual practices. In other words, the way we practice our faith, live it out day by day, is an invitation for God to be at work in our souls and in our lives, helping us to grow closer to himself. And Anna exhibited four of those practices here in the text that drive us toward thankfulness. Here's the first one. We can develop a thankful heart through corporate worship. Through corporate worship. Notice what the phrase says, verse 37. She did not depart from the temple. She was there... Night and day, fasting and praying. She didn't depart from the temple. Now, it might mean she stayed there for long parts of the day or long parts of the week. It might mean she slept there, although it's not likely that it means that she slept at the temple. Albert Barnes puts this one in his commentary. He said, when it is said that she departed down from the temple, it is meant that she was constant and regular in all the public services at the temple or was never absent from those services. In other words... Anna was a faithful participant in corporate worship. She didn't miss church. She was there when God's people gathered. And that aspect, uh, uh, that practice of what it means to be a follower of Jesus builds up gratitude in our hearts and lives. Well, how does it do that? Well, church, gathered worship of God's people, is supposed to be a reset. It's supposed to act in our lives day by day, week by week, as an opportunity to change our perspective. See, all of us walked in this morning with stuff. You walked in with frustrations. You walked in with pains. You walked in with burdens. You walked in with fears and with worries. Things that when you walk out of here, they're still going to be there. The situations you walked in with are going to be there when you walk out. But sometimes our problem with a lack of thankfulness comes because we get too focused, hyper-focused, on those things, circumstances, and situations in life. And if we're constantly focused on the things that worry us or frustrate us or challenge us or, or, or kind of cause us problems, if that's our constant focus, then guess what? We're going to be focused on those things. We're not going to show gratitude. We're going to show frustration and anger and disappointment and all those other things that happen in life. Church, gathered worship, is to be a reset. Why? Because when we gather, we're to sing the songs of faith. We're to tell one another that, that we're to praise God, that we're to acknowledge His greatness and His goodness, and we do so in song. And when I hear you sing and you hear me sing, and y'all don't know this, but I could hear you sing. Uh, I was up in the, in the baptistry getting ready to baptize and then, then getting ready to come back out, and I love hearing you as a congregation testify to God's goodness. We need that regularly because it, it gets our attention where it ought to be. So, focus, folks, our attention ought not always be on us. In fact, it ought to be on us a whole lot less than it is on us. Our attention ought to be on the God who is great and glorious. Our attention ought to be on the God of Revelation 4 who's sitting on his throne and Jesus in Revelation 5 who, who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when we gather for worship, corporate worship, what happens is you and I get an opportunity to refocus our attention on the God who is worthy of all blessing and glory and honor and praise and certainly a God who encourages gratitude and thankfulness in our lives. The aim of gathered worship is to refocus our hearts and lives on Jesus. Now, some people are here, but you're not really here. Okay? It's better to be here than not here. Can I say that? It's better to be at church than not be at church. But some folks are at church, and man, they're not happy about being at church. You, you've been to church with some of those folks. Maybe not here. I'm grateful Wilkesboro Baptist Church is a smiling, pleasurable place to be. And most of you folks join us in worship regularly. Thank God for that. But I've been at church with some folks in previous places. They weren't happy to be there. They sat there with their arms crossed and they dared you to bless them. 
They wouldn't put a smile on their face. They, would, they, would, they wouldn't sing. They were just mad, mad at the world, frustrated, angry, upset. And, and here's the point. Anna wasn't one of those folks. She was at gathered worship, but she was also participating in gathered worship. In other words, she was an active worshiper of God. That's, that's the picture of what it means to be at gathered worship. And I want you to notice this. She was regularly there. When the gathered people got to temple to worship, Anna was there with the other folks worshiping God. And you say, why does that matter? Is it okay if I miss a Sunday? I think that's asking the wrong question. God doesn't expect legalism. He's not waiting on you to be at church 52 Sundays a year. This year it would be 53 Sundays a year. God's not waiting on that. He doesn't expect that. But the regular participation in worship means that we have regular opportunities to experience God's blessings. I want you to think about this for a second. Baby Jesus was eight days old when Anna met him here. If she was too tired or too heartbroken or too grieved to go to church that day, she would have missed meeting the Messiah. Part of the reason the gathered worship is so important is because we never know what it is God's going to do in that experience of gathered worship to reset our hearts, to challenge us, to convict us, to change us, or to build gratitude in our hearts and lives. We can develop a thankful heart through gathered worship. We can develop a thankful heart, secondly, through private fasting. Notice what she said. She was fasting, uh, worshiping with fasting and prayer day and night. The part of her worship was, was fasting. Fasting, biblically, is the setting aside of food and water for a period of time in order to focus on God specifically and distinctly in one's spiritual life. It's a practice Jesus expected. In Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his followers, when you fast. He expects his followers to fast. Fasting is setting aside a moment in time of food or something else in order to give complete attention to God. And that's what Anna did. She focused on God through her fasting. Some of you hear that and say, well, the pastor's going to tell me to add a new discipline to my life. It's not a new discipline, by the way, but it is a discipline that should be more of a regular part of Christian experience than it is. We don't like to fast because we like our food, and there's nothing wrong with that. God's blessed us with an abundance of food, and you're, some of you probably need to have some time at the altar before we finish our worship service today and confess the future gluttony that is in, in, going to happen on Thursday or on Friday. I say that only jestfully. My, my whole point is this. We have a lot to be thankful for, and food is something to be thankful for. Scripture kind of connects fasting and feasting all over both the Old and New Testament. But fasting is something that we don't like to do because it means we set aside something that we do need physically or long for physically, but it gets us to something that we need more than we need food. Folks, you do need food. I need food and water. But you know what we need more than we need food and water? We need Jesus. Psalm 23 tells us, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The picture is, and the reality is, for you and I as followers of Jesus, more than we need food, we need Jesus. More than we need water, we need Jesus. So Anna fasted. I would encourage you to make fasting a regular part of your Christian experience. I think it's something you ought to do. Say, where do I start if I do that? I would encourage you to fast a meal. I'm not going to preach a whole sermon on this. I'll be done in just a moment. But if you decide to start fasting, fast for a meal. Lunch, breakfast, dinner. And in that time when you would normally eat, open up God's Word and spend that 30 or 45 minutes, or if you eat a long time, an hour, spend that, that time in prayer and in Bible reading, seeking God. And I'm going to tell you what God does when we do that. It, it teaches us self-discipline, which we need. It teaches us temperance and moderation. It, it reminds us that God is more important than anything else in our lives. And if, if that goes well, and if you practice it biblically the way Jesus teaches, maybe it will go well, and then you can add a meal to that, two meals a day. I'm going to do three meals and do a full day and seek God. I'm not telling you to start with a 40-day fast like Jesus did or several days, but what I am saying is that Anna practiced fasting. How does that build thankfulness? Because it reminded her that the most important thing she needed was God, not her food, which made her grateful for the food that she had and grateful to God for being her provision. The most thankful people are those who realize where their blessings come from, and fasting has a way of teaching us that. 
Thirdly, uh, we can develop a thankful heart through corporate or private prayer. She worshiped God with prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting go together. When we set aside food or something else to focus on God, one of the primary ways that we focus on God is through conversational prayer. She did that day and night. It's not like she had her head bowed or her hands raised in prayer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Paul told us, taught us to pray without ceasing. What she was exhibiting was that idea of prayer without ceasing. What does that look like? It looks like a regular conversation with God. Christian, do you realize that if you have trusted Jesus to be your Savior, He is with you wherever you are? Driving a car, at work, at home, at leisure, at play, fasting or eating, Jesus is with you, and we can always be in conversation with God in prayer. That's what prayer is. And her prayer was not, didn't start privately, started corporately. In other words, she was around God's people. She was gathered in the temple with God's people. Prayers were a, a vital part of, of temple worship. They prayed the Torah. They prayed out loud. They prayed together. And, and then she went and prayed privately. In other words, God's word was the framework. That's why in, in Scripture, we, or in our worship services, we begin with Scripture. And we sing from Scripture. And we pray Scripture. And we memorize Scripture and state Scripture because it forms the framework for how best we ought to pray. And Anna sought God in prayer. She prayed regularly. She prayed consistently. And, and, and I'm sure she prayed about her situations and circumstances in life. But that wasn't the driving factor of her prayer. God tells us he loves us and he, he cares about our needs. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, he teaches us that we're to pray that God would meet our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. But do you know what comes before that part of it? Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done. Biblically, prayer is more about seeking the reign of God in our lives, His kingdom, and the rule of God in our hearts, His will, than it is about seeking stuff for us. Too often, we don't find benefit in prayer because our prayers are about us. We're focused on what we want and what we need and what we think needs to happen. And I'm going to tell you, God invites us to ask all of those things of Him. He invites us to bring before Him intercessions, needs of others. He invites us to bring before Him supplications, needs of our own. But we don't need to get caught up in our own lives. That's what Anna models here. She's not so focused on herself. She's not so focused on herself that she can't seek God and God's direction through prayer. Eugene Peterson put it this way, Those people who pray know what most around them either don't know or choose to ignore. Centering their life in the insatiable demands of the ego is the sure path to doom. They know that life confined to the self is a prison, a joy-killing, neurosis-producing, disease-fomenting prison. I love how Eugene Peterson used language there to get our hearts and minds attuned to who he is, who God is, rather. Folks, I, I know of people who are struggling in, in, in immense ways. And I know of people who are going through some pretty difficult circumstances in their lives. And do you know why they're going through some of those circumstances? Because they're self-absorbed and they've created a prison out of their own independence and freedom. They have the right to do or say or act whatever way they want to do, say, or act. And they do. And they've broken hearts and they've devastated lives. Husbands that do this separate from their wives. Wives that do this separate from their husbands. Parents that do this push their kids away. Children that do this push their parents away. And, and all too often I see the, the fallout of someone living a self-absorbed, self-glorifying life. Biblically, prayer is not about us. It's about seeking God's will and God's kingdom in our lives. Why? So that we won't be the kind of people that are self-absorbed and controlled by the prisons of our own making. You know where real freedom comes from? It comes from being in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, seeking Him, devoted to Him, honoring Him, and that can be experienced through prayer. Fourthly, the fourth practice, we can develop a thankful heart through public witness. Notice what Anna did. Coming up at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God. Thanks to God for what? For meeting the Messiah. And to speak of him to all who are waiting the redemption of Jerusalem. This fascinates me. Anna had been in the temple a long time. 
Many days, many months, many years, she had spent worshiping God. She's been praying and, and praising and fasting. How did she know that this baby was different? Baby Jesus was eight days old. He had been brought to the temple to experience circumcision. How many babies had Anna watched come to the temple for that very purpose? How many times had there been sacrifices offered? How many times had circumcision taken place? And yet this baby was somebody different. I can only guess that it was the Spirit of God that let her know that this baby was someone that was a different baby. Some of you know a little bit like that. I mean, some of you, I mean, absolutely love and adore your children. And, right? I mean, your children was your child was born and they were just the prettiest thing ever. They could have been ugly as sin, but they weren't ugly as sin to you. By the way, there are no ugly babies, but none of us, you know, we always think our babies are the prettiest. And God bless us, you grandparents. It's just terrible. It's like, why did you, you should have just skipped having kids and just gone straight to grandkids because of how much you brag about your grandkids. How cute they are, how wonderful they are, how smart they are. They're going to change the world. They're going to be president. God help us. We need some of your kids to grow up and be president and politicians and congresspeople who kind of have some sense in, in their brains. Nevertheless, we think those that are connected to us are supremely special, don't we? Anna had no relational connection to Mary and Joseph. This is an eight-day-old baby boy. Here's what she said. She told everybody there that this boy was going to make a difference in the world, that there was something unique about him. How would Anna know that? Folks, she walked with Jesus. She, she walked with God. She had an experience uh, where her relationship with God gave her this opportunity to meet the Messiah, and she knew that this Messiah was going to be someone that was going to make a difference in the world. She might not have had any clue what he was going to do. She might not have had any understanding that he was going to walk on water and heal the sick, raise the dead die on the cross for the sins of the world, or be raised from the dead. She might have had no idea that any of those things were going to happen. Yet notice what she said. She gave thanks to God, and she spoke of Him. An eight-day-old baby, she spoke of Him to everybody waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Folks, 2,000 years removed from this story, you and I have the rest of the story. We know that Jesus here who was dedicated and circumcised and made ready for, for kind of being dedicated to God, we know that he would grow up to be the Savior on the cross. We know that he would grow up to heal the sick and, and open the blinded eyes. We know that he would die on a cross and be raised from the dead. We know the rest of the story so we can tell others about Jesus. You and I can be the kind of people who, because of what we've experienced through Christ, can share the good news with those who desperately need salvation. Folks, we can do that by taking shoeboxes and send them, sending them to the other side of the world. We can help mission partners by baking pumpkin pies, just showing Christ's love. We can do that by opening our mouths and actually speaking the good news of Jesus to our neighbors who are lost or going on a mission trip and taking the good news of Jesus to the nations. God's blessings are not just for our experience, but for our experience through us to others, regardless of circumstances that we face. Years ago, a girl by the name of Lauren Blakemore, she was 13 years old when she was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, a form of cancer that was in her bones that sometimes required amputation of those limbs in order to survive the cancer. She suffered and had to deal with chemotherapy for, for months. Uh, and during that period of chemotherapy, she, she cuddled with a, a blanket that was what she called a Miss Mildred blanket. Uh, a friend, a family friend, had quilted her this, this beautiful quilt that she took with her in the chemotherapy treatments. She cuddled it, she held on to it, and she used it to keep herself warm because in her mind, or, or, or in her testimony, her experience, chemotherapy made her cold. She suffered with all of that. Uh, not long after she had gone through those chemotherapy treatments, her father went to India and experienced uh, a cancer ward at a hospital in India. He looked around at all those children that were suffering with chemotherapy in a largely third world country, and he came back and he told his daughter those experiences, those things that he had seen, those children that were suffering with chemotherapy and cancer treatments there in India. 
And Lauren realized that in the situation, even in her suffering, God wanted to use her to bless somebody else. So here's what she did. She went and told her story to rotary clubs and churches and friends and neighbors and raised money so that there would be people who would quilt quilts and people who would buy blankets to make sure all those children in the cancer ward in India had a blanket because she believed every one of those children ought to be warm going through chemotherapy. Every one of those children ought to have the same comfort that she experienced. In the midst of her suffering, she still used her situation to spread the blessing that God had given her to others. Folks, that's exactly what we ought to do as followers of Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus to be your Savior. You don't understand what it means to be in a relationship with God. I would love to talk to you about faith, following Jesus. Maybe you're here and you want to learn more about Wilkesboro Baptist Church. I'd love to talk to you about Wilkesboro Baptist Church. Christian, maybe you're here this morning and you've experienced God's blessings and we just need to pause and give gratitude to God. Oftentimes at an invitation, I'll ask you to come bring a burden to the altar or come make a decision to, to kind of turn your life back to Christ. And, and that invitation is available. But listen, Christian, I want to talk to you for just a second. Sometimes we think of this altar as a place where change needs to happen. And it is. But it's also a place where public thanksgiving can be given. Some of you have experienced some wonderful things from God. And maybe today, by way of testimony and praising Him, not coming to the altar with a burden, but coming to the altar with a blessing. Maybe you just want to bow your knee and join me and thank God for what he's done for you and for his saving work in your life. Maybe you do need to trust Jesus. Maybe you need to turn your heart over to God. Maybe you need to experience his, his goodness in your soul. Whatever you need to do, this invitation is going to be an opportunity for you to meet with God or praise God. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to go to the Lord in time of prayer. If you'd like to bring an offering of thanks to the Lord at the invitation, you do so. Our God, we come to you this morning. We recognize that so many of us are facing circumstances and challenges that truly make it difficult in our lives. And I am um, aware of that in my own life. I'm aware of that in the lives of so many people in our congregation. Pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us, like Anna, not to allow our circumstances to keep us from giving thanks. Lord, teach us to put these practices in place regularly so that we can be thankful people, Christ-like people, Christ-honoring people. Lord, have your way in our worship service. You know the one or several here this morning who need to trust you as Lord and Savior. You know the ones who do have genuine, legitimate burdens that are, that are breaking their heart, that are tearing them down. I pray, Lord, that they meet you and they'd meet the God who can meet them where their needs are. Lord, I pray for so many of us. Give us hearts of gratitude and thankfulness. And Lord, I pray that you would hear our words of, thank, of thanksgiving. So we pray to you in just a moment and be praised and glorified through that. In Christ's name. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.